Uh, one other footnote. Can you hear me okay in the back? One other kind of footnote to history. There was a good couple of days there where um, we're trying to figure out what to name the project. Uh, this was, it started out as iOS Auto, so this could have been the iOS Auto Conference. I figured that was too limiting, but that was your original name for the thing. Um, we went through a previous, you know, good maybe a week or two where it was Apple Cart. So this almost could have been the Apple Cart Conference. Uh, but we actually read through the uh, term, like the Apple puts out their little trademark guidance. And said, if you put the word Apple in anywhere in your product, we'll sue you. And we figured, eh, oh, yeah, let's not do that. So we renamed it to Apple and then yeah, the rest is history. So welcome to not the not Apple Cart Conference. Um, there's a running joke in pretty much all of my demos, I'll probably be doing this to my dying day, is that Angry Birds makes um, an appearance. Um, and uh, I would call it, this is Hello World. If you're gonna make a robot um, interact with an mobile device, and you have to do a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, Angry Birds is like a perfect video game. Um, it's, it's hard to test. Uh, it made an appearance in Johnson Lewis Lightning Talk last night because you need image recognition. So it's actually a relatively simple game, at least the first level. Um, but it also flushes out a whole bunch of technical issues. Anyway, um, there, I'll come back to this at the end, but there's this cool little feature um, in iOS 13 uh, that just came out like last week. So I kind of uh, had to like delete about half my presentation because I wanted to show you some cool stuff that I did with this. This is a USB mouse and this is like a new feature. Uh, this is running iOS 13, so it's only available as, like a, uh, as a beta and it'll be available in the fall. So I know you want me to actually play the thing. So there was also a lightning talk yesterday, building up the suspense. That you, you know, manual testing is really important. There's a certain thing where, even with my demos, that even though I'm trying to trick it out with crazy animation, there's a certain argument that if you can't even test it manually, then why even bother with the robot? Right? So once I proved that it could work with a manual mouse, then I tried to figure out how to replace it with robots and stuff like that. Anyway, so that's, you know, if lightning strikes and uh, nothing happens and say, hey, I showed you something kind of cool here. Ooh, and one star. I, I need to get better at that. Um, so if the demo gods are not, yikes. Let's see. How do I get out of here? That's super annoying. Let's kill that. There we go. So I'm with the main attraction. Um, I changed the talk title. It used to be World Domination Plans, like version two or something. Um, but this, uh, I modified it because for reasons. Uh, don't fear the robot. So this is my argument to you. Don't worry about robots taking your jobs. It's, com it's going to be super complex. So thanks for having me. Uh, this is me out outside my, my office. I took this picture on like January 15th or so in Chicago. It gets really cold in the winter. I think we actually had the, the record coldest day ever on record this year. Um, and so the, one cool thing about when it's, I, I forgot what's in Celsius, but actually there's a point where it gets so cold, Celsius and Fahrenheit actually converge. So it's like once it's like negative 30 or 40 or so, it's actually the same temperature, whatever. Um, but the cool thing is when it's this cold, you can walk around with, with um, swimming goggles and no one will even notice, right? Because um, I am. Anyway, uh, but yeah, so uh, I'm only, I only live a block and a half away from my office, but you should come visit us. Uh, we're in Oak Park, uh, just west of the city. Um, anyway, uh, luckily I don't have to wear this setup uh, to office anymore. It's like nice and warm right now. Also, I'm Hugs on Twitter, so follow me, uh, heckle me throughout this talk or afterwards. Uh, and it makes sense because like my last name is Huggins, so Hugs, whatever. Anyway. Um, I'm actually more of a fist bump person, so I'm actually not much of a hugger, so anyway. Um, there's this thing that I've kind of noticed. Uh, does anyone know about the curse of Cassandra? You know the Greek history? All right, two people. Um, so uh, Greek, um, the curse of Cassandra. Cassandra was given the ability to predict the future, but the curse is, and it's there in the bottom, Cassandra was cursed to utter prophecies that were true, but no one believed her. Uh, so sometimes I feel like I'm Cassandra, uh, and I'll go through my greatest, greatest hits of future predictions that no one that no one believed at the time. Uh, Selenium, uh, 2004, everyone thought JavaScript was a career-limiting move to actually use that in your, in your applications. I looked this up. If you go look for the first release date, everything changed about six months later when Google Maps first came out, and that was crazy JavaScript. That came out actually in 2005. Um, they acquired the company that, uh, Google acquired the company that made Google Maps in, in 2004, but 2005 is when they first made it as a Google release. And then after that, um, then all of a sudden was, everyone was trying to make crazy web applications with tons and tons of JavaScript. And so Selenium was just a couple months early to kind of ride that Ajax Web 2.0, whatever you want to call it, um, wave. But the big thing was like, how do we test JavaScript? We, it went from you shouldn't do it to, oh, hey, let's do that. 
Um, fast forward to 2008, the big thing with founding Sauce Labs was uh, we're going to do everything in the cloud. We're going to take everything from the desktop and put it in the cloud. And uh, we found it in the summer of 2008, and we didn't get um, any funding. We didn't get success with, with investors until a full year later. I was, only, I was almost a week away from quitting and going to try to maybe get my old job back or something like that um, because I'd gone a year without salary and we weren't getting any interest from any investor anywhere. And we were meeting with all the usual suspects uh, on Sand Hill Road in, in the Bay Area and no one was uh, interested, uh, especially developer tools. Like who's interested in developer tools? There's, there's, no, you know, there's no market there. So that, that was another kind of time where like, man, I really think there's something in this cloud thing, but, but no one would believe me. Um, going to 2012, at this point things are getting a little bit easier. At this point, the iPhone and Android were obviously a thing. I think that the particular thing with the um, uh, no one believing us was like there were tons of other tools that were out there. So why Appium, right? I'll come back to this at the end, but there's a core philosophy that's in Appium that was different, is different than all the other tools that are out there. But at the time, no one really, you know, how do they know to believe us versus anybody else as far as whether you should use this tool for some, uh, versus all the others. Uh, and then fast forward a couple of years to 2015, that's when I formally incorporated Tapster, that's like my current gig right now. Um, and I would argue that even, especially actually, with the committers on this project and the Selenium committers, it, uh, this robot thing is a tough sell. I'm totally having fun geeking out, and everyone kind of appreciates that, but it's just like, okay, that's great, and then back to work, right? No robots. Um, I would argue that just like all those other things, that robots are definitely in our future, in your future, or could be your future. Um, uh, but right now, I'm still kind of going through that phase where everyone just thinks I'm crazy. Um, but I've kind of, you know, now I can hang out with Cassandra and you know, Misery and our beers. Um, anyway, all these years ago, the way I would describe Selenium is that it's like a robot. Um, it's, you know, a virtual robot. You tell it to go open a URL, type text in a field, click buttons, things like that. I would often use this image um, almost as a joke. Like, like this is a metaphor uh, for what Selenium is. Uh, I can't find the actual original source for this robot. Now when I Google, like, do an image search for this, all I do is find my presentations about it. I think it was a research project in Japan. I think it was called FOXX, but I can't find anybody. So if you know somebody who actually worked on this actual project. Um, but it's got some cameras and robot arms up here. Like, oh yeah, that's going to be kind of what, you know, testing is going to be. Um, but now I would say it actually is a robot. And part of the reason why I've got all these things is that I want to, at some point, you know, test everything. I even wanted to test my metaphors um, and, and see if, if it's like a robot actually is a thing. Um, and so this is the latest version of my robot that we've got kind of cooking in the kitchen. Um, and of course, there's a theme here on, as far as what it's automating. <laughs> You know, the funny thing is, don't ask me to play the next level. It's just the first level. Uh, so, the other thing about this is that there's a, there's a frame that it can kind of get locked into. I've got other little actuators that can hit the volume up and volume down. Um, they've got these little kind of movable pads to kind of, it can support like any phone. Uh, so anyway, I've been working on this. This is like the, the latest one, actually, all these years into it. Um, what I'll call, the other metaphor, I don't know where the interference is coming from here. Um, the other metaphor that I would kind of talk about as far as what I'm doing, both with my art projects my, on, on, in my personal life and then also professionally, is that I'm doing kind of the reverse Tron. If you're not familiar with the movie Tron, it was about people getting sucked into the computer and then getting trapped in this video game. And so what I call like the reverse Tron is like taking people or things, or robots, virtual robots, in the computer and trying to take them out into the real world. I've got various art projects um, that actually Tapster is a spin-off of that I was trying to take a, an animated 3D display and make a 3D version of that. And I've kind of noticed that a similar thing with Tapster is basically the um, reverse Tron version of Selenium. Uh, this was the very first robot that I made. Um, oddly, I showed it off at the first Jenkins conference in 2011. Um, sometimes I call this uh, embarrassment-driven development. I actually said, I put it in the talk proposal. Um, I'm going to make a robot play Angry Birds. I hadn't made a robot play Angry Birds at that point, but I kind of wanted to do it, so I used the conference as a way to force me to do it. Um, and of course, if I didn't get it done, I'd be highly embarrassed. Anyway, embarrassment of all mode. It's fun. Um, I still don't know what it actually has to do with Jenkins, but it, you know, that, it, it was uh, unveiled there in like October 2011. Um, and this is actually the demo. Of the I apologize for the 
blurriness of this. I was recording it about 10, 15 minutes before I actually went on stage, and it's only working for the first time. 10 minutes, 4 minutes. 10, 10 minutes before I went on stage. Um, again, one star. It's not, not a very good robot. Um, some folks saw the YouTube version of this, and they said, actually, your robot's kind of lame, and it's really slow. Uh, so I took that as you know, useful uh, feedback, and over the years I've been trying to improve it. So I, again, um, kind of using Angry Birds as like my uh, my muse, if you will, uh, on how to improve things. Uh, this is uh, a couple of generations later, uh, and this is also kind of like my side thing at Sauce. I'm still you know full time at Sauce at this time, and uh, this was just kind of like a, an interesting thing to work on on the side. Again, still Angry Birds. It's getting better at it. It's a lot faster. Uh, this style of robot is called a Delta robot. It was invented by a Swiss engineer uh, in the 80s. And no joke, uh, it was invented to pick up chocolates off the assembly line and put them in boxes. Everything was, man was automated about making the chocolates. It said that last part about putting the chocolates in the boxes. So he came up with this design as a conveyor belt comes by. Um, a Delta style robot is arguably the fastest kind of design. Uh, you can go read the expired now uh, patent about it. The math is crazy, ridiculous. I barely understand it, but luckily people have implemented math libraries for it, so you don't have to worry about it. But anyway, so Delta robots are kind of cool. So that explains a huge jump and kind of the uh, change in how the robot looks. Usually I'm just trying to go for a faster design. Um, something interesting kind of take happened after uh, I gave the presentation at, um, for that first robot. It was called Bitbeam Robot at the time. Um, it got picked up in popular science. Um, it also led to some uh, interviews uh, at other places. And what happened was uh, things got really weird. Uh, what I didn't realize is that there are secret robot labs literally everywhere. Anybody making a, a phone, so all the usual suspects, Samsung, Apple, you name it, um, anyone's making a physical product, they have a secret robot lab. I mean, also telecom, everybody. Keyword secret. We all we don't know about it. And if you do work at one, you're not allowed to talk about it, right? Uh, occasionally there's some headlines. You could probably go Google for them of like, it's one that um, uh, hit the US press. It was like a lawsuit um, and actual criminal charges between um, uh, T-Mobile. Uh, T-Mobile was the um, aggrieved party. And then another company actually was stealing their designs. Their robot was called Tappy, the tapping robot. And they used it for testing uh, uh, phones. Anyway, so, so the secret robot labs are actually a big thing. And I only knew this because after I put my first robot out there, they came to find me. I don't know how to find the secret robot labs. That I, um, they have to, I, you know. Uh, Self-identify, and so I had lots of interesting conversations where this whole thing kind of went from like this silly hobby, just kind of getting robots out of my system, but I'm going to keep working on the software side, um, to actually like, oh, maybe there's something to this robot thing, because like I'm actually the first skeptic on, as far as like, okay, is there really actual? Could you actually be, um, you know, your day job could be playing with robots? Like, I don't know. At least, especially around in 2012, I didn't think so. Um, but let's back up. So. Why robots? This is what, what's my argument for it? And especially why now? And why should you care? The big thing that I would believe is that testing is getting really weird. We already kind of know that. Um, I, mean, I think only in retrospect we realized we actually had it really great for a couple of decades there with like desktop testing was just keyboard, video, mouse. That's all you needed and you're good to go. And it's amazing how complex automation is just given that. But now it's even harder when you have testing your refrigerator and medical devices and cars and all kinds of stuff. And so uh, I've, over the years, kind of been collecting examples. Um, some things are the secret robot lab stuff that eventually go public. Other things are just kind of floating out there. Uh, this is arguably my favorite video of a test automation scenario ever, ever. Um, There's this brilliant thing of solving the problem, but also in a super creative way. This is made by Tyro. Um, they do software development consulting. And they are testing. Uh, mobile or uh, uh, NFC payments. So uh, it just goes on a track, and they had three different kinds of payments, and so that's like a little kind of smart card. And they needed to; they were doing some kind of implementation, and they just had this running on a loop, and that's how they do their test um, their test automation. I figured this is, this is brilliant, right? Especially for me, because it's like again, I kind of almost meditate on this because like I'm over, I'm so prone to just overcomplicate things, and this is just beautiful in its simplicity. I went down to the toy store, got a train set, boom. Uh, mobile payment, test automation, done and done. Uh, this, um, a couple of, I was asked uh, by my coworkers uh, a long time ago, like, hey, what are you going to do with this robot thing? I didn't know. 
Um, but I figured, okay, well, let's just keep asking people and getting more people involved. We, ha we had a, a workshop to build the, these Tapster robots uh, in New York City. Uh, and there were some folks, I think from RGA at the time, and they were working on the implementation for Nike, for the software that, they're working on the Nike Fuel Band, for the, like the iPhone version of it. And so they were there to build robots. And the intention was, you know, if you see on the, uh, on the robot itself, that there's an outline for where a phone goes, right? So I figured, like, that's how you do the, this. How you, this is how you do robot mobile testing. You put the phone there. The problem that they had, and this blew my mind, when you're um, testing an uh, accelerometer, a, pedo a pedometer, I'm sorry, for testing the number of steps you take during the day, well, how do you know that your phone is actually working unless you actually shake your, the fuel band or the Fitbit or whatever? And so they, were, they used Tapster to literally shake the thing as an as a end, end integration test. Um, I thought like, okay, this is like maybe the early examples of uh, testing is getting weird. Um, this example is from Mercedes. It started in Sunnyvale, it's actually now, this project is actually based here in Bangalore, they moved it here. Um, and this was the project where I decided to go from hobby to um, full-time, actually incorporating as Tapster Robotics Incorporated, because they asked for 10 robots. And at that point I realized like, okay, if a big car company is asking for this stuff, I need to, you know, um, I guess treat it as seriously as, as they are, right? I mean, I was treating it seriously, but okay, I think maybe this is a thing. Anyway, so this is their fancy glossy demo um, of the, the, the interaction that they're testing. Um, you can kind of see in a couple of seconds here what this is. He, this person has a phone, and so they need a robot actually to test the phone. But what the end-to-end the -end interaction is is that this is a self-parking feature for the Mercedes car. And that's if you notice that right there. Let's see it again. The person's just drawing, drawing a circle. That, that's all they're doing. It's kind of like a dead man switch. I kind of maybe get a better view when uh, they get, unfortunately, a uh, fancy car, but uh, couldn't get access to a uh, wider parking spot apparently. Again, uh, just drawing a circle. What ends up being is like, is you're not actually driving the car, but you're telling the car that you're still alive or within range, things like that. And so they didn't they didn't have an, a way to automate, wait, to test, automate that. The other thing, given the car industry specifically, there's a requirement, either legally, also just policy-wise, to test everything literally as exactly and closely as a human would be interacting with the system. You can't run it through a simulator. Um, you can't even uh, use the USB cable. It literally has to be the, the standard App Store app, and you're interacting with it uh, in a very non-intrusive way. So that's kind of a key word. Sometimes if you have requirements, either legally or policy-wise, to like not go through the instrumentation, you have to do it as exactly the way a user would. Uh, robots are sometimes the answer. And this is the Tapster version of it. Um, okay, let's try out this. Uh, so I randomly post videos, videos to YouTube. Different. Usually there's the context, like this Mercedes thing, but I can't talk about that or couldn't at the time. Um, I think right around the minute mark, I actually do my demo Everybody's for the circle. Everybody's favorite. Circle. And so that was, uh, that was the test automation thing that they couldn't do any and other way. And counterclockwise. And the requirements were ridiculous. I had to do clockwise, counterclockwise, and also starting anywhere on a circle and, and ending anywhere on a circle. And implementing Ooh. it was not so easy because I had to plot all the points in a circle. You can't just draw a circle on a screen. I actually had to animate through all the points. Uh, and also I had to make a couple customized versions of this for like the large size versions. Anyway. Um, okay, let's. And then uh, for a different client, they were more focused on kind of the server side of things, but they needed two phones kind of texting each other uh, to kind of generate traffic. So, you know, Facebook chatting or text messaging or something like that. If you're the server and you want to see what happens when two things are talking to each other, um, well, you need, and they also had the requirements to, you know, can't, can't modify the phone, whatever. In this particular demo that I gave them, I thought seeing two robots text back and forth to each other saying, yo, hey, what's up? I thought that was kind of boring. So I thought the moral equivalent of that is uh, GarageBand, because why not, right? Keyboards, hitting keys, or uh, hitting the piano keys. And so I figured, okay, if I have two, the other thing, the other requirement is that they wanted to have one computer orchestrate multiple robots. They wanted to be able to do orchestration. That was like the other big question that they had. Um, so I figured if I can get kind of a, a small little duet going, then um, you know that would win the day. So everyone usually hates this song. I really hate this song now. Uh, typical style. This was like 3 a.m. in my basement, trying to kind of keep it low, not wake anybody up before I had to go to the airport like two hours later. So fun. Crowd favorites. Um, 
So other things, uh, versions later on, uh, I think it's actually the same client for this one, uh, upped my uh, audio game, No More Heart and Soul. The particular requirement was to get to the Android bootloader screen, again, without doing it any other, with, without doing it through a USB cable. So this demo is turning on a phone from a cold start, getting to the Android bootloader screen and turning off the phone. If you go back and watch 2001, kind of like landing on the moon, there's kind of, I was kind of going for that vibe there. Uh, just nice, graceful robots moving through space. Um, th but the feedback, though, that I got on this one was that, uh, again, too slow. Uh, side note to side notes, uh, there's these in famous interviews with Jeff Bezos from Amazon. And he says, don't ask me what I think is going to be in the future or what's going to be changing. Uh, the thing he likes to think about is what's, what's not going to change in the future. Uh, and he says, things will, people will always want things to be faster. I think the interference comes. Oops, I thought about it. Um, you'll always want things to be faster. You'll always want it to be cheaper. Uh, and there's a third one. Um, I forgot it. I'll come back to it. But faster was the, was the key thing. Um, or a more, more selection, more availability, right? You don't want to be limited in your choices. Um, and so the feedback I got from this was that it's too slow. And that was a common theme. That was a problem with Selenium, all the, even Appium in the early days. Like everyone always complains about the speed. Oh, other side note. There is something I've observed in my career. People, they're given a choice, go ask your developers, have them choose between slow and correct or fast and wrong. And 100% of the time they'll choose fast and wrong. Anyway, just kind of observation. Um, I would argue, I try to argue, but I always fail that like actually Selenium goes at the speed of your users and it's slow and it's correct, but no one cares. Um, they just want it fast. So, so with the latest version of this thing, I figured I'd murder the it's slow argument. And I, I clocked this at like 800 taps per minute. Uh, so I figured like, is this good enough for you? And I'm like, yeah, OK. It was also nice, uh, I did some research on if I had this play music. I think if you look at the entire catalog of all human music, beats per minute, like the fastest song ever before it just sounds like a solid tone. It's, it's somewhere less than 800 taps per minute. So theoretically, I've got a good theoretical base for playing the fastest song. It's probably going to be some kind of speed metal song. That might be coming in a future Appian conference. Demo. Um, so there's a, there's a kind of various kind of so what factors to this. That was one of the things I picked up um, when I worked at ThoughtWorks, where the Selenium project came from. Um, and uh, there was a person in sales um, that were, they were famous for always saying, that's a great demo, but like, so what? Like, why is anyone going to care about this or buy it or whatever? Um, but there, another kind of other aspect to this is kind of where to start. And I'm self-taught in this stuff. I, I studied software in college, but I did not study robotics. Um, and I kind of mostly started from an art project that I've been still kind of working on, where I picked up electronics and the mechanical sides of things. And so all these years later, you're kind of looking at like where I am of like 20 years of like stumbling through learning this stuff on my own. It would have been nice if I'd gone through school and just learned it in a more faster uh, time. But if, if you think, I would hope out of this, like you might be inspired to go start playing around with toys and robots and you know start tackling those weird testing scenarios, uh, where would you start today? Uh, I've got on here a couple of these boards, different versions of them. But it's actually not too expensive to, to start. Uh, an, Arduino, an Arduino Uno is like $22. It's about 1,500 um, uh, rupees. And uh, something that's very uh, closely related to that is the Raspberry Pi that came uh, that was shown off in Jonathan's keynote yesterday. Their uh, Raspberry Pi is a little bit more, a lot more capable. Uh, you do more things, but there's some nice things about the Arduino. Uh, especially if you want to do very fast kind of timing of like uh, driving stepper motors and kinds of things like that. Like actually a small little microcontroller and not a big operating system that's on the uh, Raspberry Pi. Um, might be better. Anyway, pros and cons, but not too expensive. The other thing to think about with robotics is that there's going to be three things that you need to know. There's the software side, and arguably if you're here, you're either no software or you're like on the path, you have the access to resources to learn the software side of things. And there's other two things. There's the, the learning electronics for uh, you know, triggering sounds or driving motors or all kinds of stuff. And then the, thir the third part is mechanical, like building literally the, the structure to or, um, hold these things. And if you're going to be working on a, some kind of end-to-end -end 
test scenario, whatever, poking buttons on things, you're going to need to put it in a physical skeleton, for lack of a better phrase. Um, and so what I would argue is if you're going to try to find a place to start, uh, Lego Mindstorms is a great place. And this is like for, t for a couple of reasons. Um, when I asked the folks at Mercedes, like, well, if you hadn't talked to me or found me, uh, what would you have done? And this is literally their answer. They said, we would have dedicated two engineers, given them a couple of months, and a Lego Mindstorms kit, and see what they come up with. So I'm arguably like Lego is like my competition, right? Um, this ends up being kind of a, a thing for like, kind of we also observed this with Selenium project back in the day. When people are just kind of duct tape uh, and chicken wire their own solutions in house, uh, that's usually a good sign that like there's a desperate need for some kind of product that's out there. Uh, and I'm not arguing that you need to buy my robots. Like go and get some stuff from Lego um, and kind of cobble things together. But the, the thing about Lego is that um, uh, you don't have to start from scratch. You have some of the building blocks that, there, that are there. You can kind of get going faster. The other thing though that you might observe, um, and this is this blows, blew my mind um, as a kid who played with Lego. I was always frustrated that like I couldn't design my own Lego pieces. Um, Oh, sorry, and just with Lego Mindstorms, these, these were kind of all the pieces you have. You have enough, just enough to get started. You have motors and sensors and all kinds of things. So if you're, from a testing point of view, needed to push a button or move something around, um, you have just enough of what you need. And you have a supplier that you can go back and get all the other pieces that you need more of them. Um, the other thing, though, for the pieces that you don't have, uh, three printers, you know, they've kind of gone through a huge hype wave, but there's still some utility there. Um, this particular printer, I recommend it because it's only $150. They, they were, back when 3D printers were invented, there were tens of thousands of dollars. Now, for modern price, it's like super cheap, impulse buy um, kind of a thing. And uh, some kind of playing, this is like the summer project now, is to uh, uh, you know, see how good this is. Uh, but if you're trying to get started, like get an Arduino, a Raspberry Pi, Lego Mindstorms kit, maybe a 3D printer. And the reason why I also, again, kind of showing about the 3D printer, uh, here's an example of something that actually looks similar to my other robots. Um, this is called EV3 Printer Bot. And uh, if you notice these two pieces right here, that, those came off of a 3D printer because, that, because Lego doesn't make a piece that holds a pen. So you can print those small parts for just what you need. And, you, and actually holding a pen is going to be very common if you're making a robot hold a stylus and touch on the screen, something like that. And then this is their, um, this is this robot. So the, the plans for this are online. Um, to it off of the YouTube page. Um, this video is kind of sped up, um, but uh, there, uh, there's a built version of this now on my desk. It's another summer project to go kind of play around with this. Um, Quality is actually pretty good as far as precision. Um, and the key thing to know is that other than those two white pieces that were printed, everything else comes in the standard Lego Mindstorms kit. So arguably, you could put a phone or an iPad underneath this and you can start doing this today. Get the kit, download these plans, and you're off to the races. Um, all right, okay, great, cool story. But what does this have to do with Appium, or the Appium conference? It's kind of like showing off a robot at the Jenkins conference. Like, okay. um, well, one thing I would point out, uh, I'm kind of, because I've been so focused on the robots, I haven't been day to day in the trenches in Appium in a long time. Um, but one thing, trying to get back into it, I've kind of noticed like, some things are pretty gnarly and still and really complex. Um, specifically, if you're doing iPhone automation, the State of the art right now on the project is to use XCUI test um, to kind of get to all of the stuff that you need to get to. Um, but the key thing that to call this out, and, and I don't mean any offense to the folks here or watching this who's worked on this, like you're doing amazing work, um, and I love you. Uh, but there's this, I just pulled this straight off of the documentation of that page. While this is simple in theory, the hoops of code signing and provisioning applications for development and testing can make this a bit of a headache, right? It's like the story of our lives. Um, it was true then, it's true now. Um, and so I would like to remind you, again, I, some stuff I just copied off the appium.io webpage. It was true at the beginning of the project, um, of the Selenium project, actually, and Appium. This is right off of the Appium about page. One, you shouldn't have to recompile your app or modify it in any way in order to automate it. You shouldn't be locked into a specific language or framework to write and run your tests. A mobile automation framework shouldn't reinvent the wheel when it comes to automation APIs. And that's actually why we put WebDriver in front of all this stuff, because that was a, a good automation API. And a mobile automation framework should be open source in spirit and practice as well as in name. 
So that's the Appium philosophy. That was what was different. That's what separated, those four things separated Appium from all the other tools that are out there, proprietary or open source. And it's amazing, like no one copied it. It's like, anyway, but they didn't believe that this was a good idea. Now I think it's a good idea. Um, anyway, so, so, so um, keeping that philosophy in mind, something came up at Apple's WW, or whatever, their, their, their conference um, a week or two ago. They unveiled some new accessibility goodies in iOS 13, specifically uh, being able to control an iPhone with a mouse. Now granted, if you're an Android person, this has been old news for years. Uh, Android is, you can plug in a keyboard or mouse, no big deal. But iPhone has always been this annoying thing to automate. Um, so on kind of a hunch, uh, anyway, got a phone, um, download the developer beta. It's not publicly available, so if you have a developer account, you can go in and install it. Um, they have found a couple of little quirks. But uh, this is just playing around with uh, manually. Again, kind of that other theme there of manual testing before automation. So just to see if it's even possible. Uh, and this is a USB mouse that I'm kind of just futz around with. Again, there's this uh, possible idea. The reason why I kind of brought up the phone app or messaging, things like that, is because it was definitely true at the beginning of the Appian project. You could only automate your application. You couldn't automate the settings or any other application that you uh, don't control. I've also had recent conversations with some people where they don't have access to like the developer. They can't get the developer version of the app um, onto their phone. Like they're, they're just like, sadly, either for political reasons or technical or revenue or money reasons, whatever, they have to um, use the same version of the app that everyone else gets to, right? So it'd be nice to be able to not have to modify it and still be able to test it, right? Um, and the, the idea here with this, with the, with the mouse, even though it, you don't have access to the tree of elements, you could at least get something tested. So I had a hunch here where that, um, well, if you can do it with a manual mouse, potentially you can make a fake mouse and control that fake mouse to uh, play Angry Birds. Right? Um, so again, uh, part, going down this hunch, there's a version of Arduino that kind of echoes back to, you know, if you play around with Arduino, you might not actually know where this is going to apply to work, but if you have some of these skill sets, you, you've got a bigger toolbox that you can instantly apply to something. And so this little demo, it's, it's, it's sending mouse commands authentically, just like the mouse, my manual mouse was. Um, and so I had to have it running on a loop because I had no way to control it. Um, it's like half the equation of what you need to drive it from Appium. And so I have it going up, down, left, right, and click. And actually what it's automating is pinthing.com. This is like my, this is my art project that Tapster is a spin-off of. I want to make a, I made the software version because um, I didn't know how to make the electronic version, but this idea of making all, um, thousands or millions of linear actuators and you have this cool 3D display or something like that. Or you can make it like a, maybe like a waterbed or something. I don't know. I'm still working on it. Um, but I have pinthing.com is where I often, besides Angry Birds, where I kind of test little things. So it's like, hey, success. I can move around and I can click a button on the website, so like that's cool. But I still don't have a way to automate it, um, except for miraculously, 24 hours ago, <laughs> Jonathan uh, solved the problem. Yay! Um, and the cool thing about under the hood is uh, driving the Raspberry Pi is very similar to driving the Arduino. And he also kind of did all the hard work of kind of putting a, the, the Appium front end to that. Um, so it, it's up there. Um, I will post the links later. I can also just find Jonathan and ask him more about it. Uh, and so my version, I think, will be maybe when I post it later, it'll be a fork of that project and it'll be Appium dash Arduino driver. And so we've instantly, in 24 hour period, have gone from you know a cobbled mess of you know all the mobile platforms to now uh, drum machines and uh, well, it's still the iPhone, but like doing it in crazy ways. Um, so this is. Uh, the next step. And if I can kind of show my mouse here, I wonder if I can zoom in, ex enhance. Um, what's going on here? I don't have a schematic. Sorry, I'll do that maybe later. Um, on the right side, you have the thing, kind of a the version that you saw before, the, the video, um, that it can act like, the thing on the right can act like a mouse. The thing on the left talks to the map, to the laptop. And it can answer, it can, um, it can listen for commands and do stuff. And then the wires, uh, it's the implementation of the I2C uh, protocol. Just like you have USB or Ethernet or CAN bus in a car, I2C is a way for like smart things in 
on motherboards or computers, whatever, for them to kind of devices that they how they can talk to each other. So I'm using I2C. There's another uh, weird thing. Um, it's called another word for the I2C protocol is the two wire protocol, which ironically it's actually three wires because you need to you always put a common ground. So they could have called it three wire protocol. Anyway, um, but the two wires, the yellow wire is the data wire, and then kind of I got little inside jokes in my various things. Um, uh, that's the clock line, so it's the clock or orange um, movie reference there, whatever. Anyway, so I always, in all of my designs, the clock line is always orange. Anyway, um, cool story. So this is the demo. And this is being driven by Appium. So that's the electronics version of it. And then here's the kind of the, the view of what I saw on my laptop. So I'm, I'm using a, uh, I'm streaming the video over AirPlay to my screen. On the left, you on the left bottom, you have the Appium server that'll be hopefully on GitHub soon. And on the right is my test script written in Python that's doing throw, and then there's a couple of things to play the game. I hit that button on the bottom right. No verification, sorry. And also a lot of sleep statements, sorry. But you can kind of see if you zoom in maybe later, um, you can, it's an authentic Appium script. So as far as your test is concerned, it doesn't know that it's, you know, talking to random things. Um, this is also kind of interesting because sometimes like, you know, my argument to working with robots is like, I'm not gonna expect everyone on the Appian project to have this on their desk just to keep support for the, the robot stuff. But now I have just this small thing that's kind of the moral equivalent of the robot um, that can, uh, so, so hopefully in the future, maybe when you're testing future versions of Appium, you might have, besides all the phones on your desk, you might have a couple of these little circuit boards around that kind of represent the like electronic circuit board version of some bigger robot. Uh, I could do this as a live demo. I'm kind of tempted to. Um, maybe I'll do that. Uh, here's some code. I'll probably show it later. You can't really see it. Um, but there's a certain level of I override the uh, perform touch thing. Got some really awesome guidance from Jonathan uh, on how to do this. This is the code that I wrote very recently in the last 24 hours. Um, if I, right before I give the demo, fun fact, um, I flew all the way from Chicago, stopped in London a couple days ago. I had uh, just enough of a layover to leave Heathrow, go have coffee with Simon, show him my demo, and then uh, get back to Heathrow and then get on the plane to, uh, to Bangalore. So just as like kind of like insurance before my live demo. All right, three, two, one, go. Hi, I'm Simon Stewart, the current leader of the Selenium project, talking to Jason Huggins who created Selenium. I've seen the live demo, he can make it work. I've seen it, it works. Thank so you, if you don't believe it doesn't work live, here's some proof, at least my, my testimonial from Simon, thanks. <laughs> I'm very, uh, very uh, tired at this point, right? So on that note, let's um, let's see if I actually can do a live demo very quickly. Um, it's not really appropriately, uh, you know, a real technical conference unless we have a failed demo. So I'm just going to say if it fails, that means like we're we're on the bleeding edge. First thing I'm going to start my Appium server. Uh, the next thing I'm going to do is not this. I probably want to bring up. So you can see the screen. I'm going to turn on screen mirroring. Oh, here we go. So, pardon for the awkward pause here. Doing it live. Had those video backups and the testimonial because live demos are precarious. And of course, I apologize if you're sick of Angry Birds, but that's what you're going to get. Oh man, I crashed it. I hadn't seen that before. Let's so try this one more time. Welcome back. Okay. Ooh. Oh, there's an ad. Ah, unexpected pop-ups. Okay, so um, darn it. Sorry. I need to turn off full screen mode. And then um, the name of my phone is Jason's Terminators T-799 reasons for that. wonder what will be the next version. Okay, let's see. 
Uh, if I can make this smaller. Sorry. Come on. So I can see the. Uh, oh, screw it. So the server is running. I really don't know if this is going to work. Just remember, Simon saw it. So I'm going to connect. Hey! All right. And I'm going to play Angry Birds. Come on, don't let me down. We're doing it live, folks. <laughs> and we got the three stars. All right. I am dropping the mic. All right. Thank you. Hopefully the code will be up later. Um, if not, you can also kind of check out Jonathan's code that he literally just put out yesterday. Uh, and also, yeah, find me on Twitter, send me an email, or just find me at the conference. Um, I'll probably have my, I'll probably rock in the hallway track today um, with some version of these demos running at the table. All right, thank you. All right, what's next? I go. All oh, right, cool. Oh, I thought it was like right out of time. I'm right on time. Okay, cool. So how does this work then? Someone have a mic? Right. Copying my slides is really going to be very hard because it's like several gigabytes in size because it's all these video files. No, I'll, I'll copy it. It's like how much space you got. Oh, maybe, yeah, maybe it'll work. Sorry. <laughs> Someone has a question, please. please. Hey, Hugs, nice job. Um, so in my mind, that demo is like one half of a full-fledged um, interactive uh, testing thing. Yes. Is there any way to, say, retrieve screenshots from the device in line with this sort of thing? Because then you could use Appium's image testing to like, get full-blown automation out of this. Right, so one thing I discovered on the path to this, I still was able to get the image on screen. Once you could get the image on screen, you could then do the image recognition stuff. Um, there was something that you had in your demo that I couldn't do in mine. I think this is a bug in iOS 13 right now. Um, but in the previous version, you can, your phone can act like a webcam, like the screen, when, when you bring up QuickTime Player and you can select the video sources, like you're selecting other kind of video cameras, you can select the video source. And there's a whole bunch of open source tools that can kind of get, grab frames, including like OpenCV, like all of the usual suspects for um, image recognition, open source stuff. Because the iPhone can act like a webcam, there's tons of all of the finding objects thing assumes a webcam. Um, however, because I had to use this fancy dongle to um, plug in the USB phone, it, it broke that whole showing up as a webcam thing. Um, so I'm hoping that Apple fixes it somewhere in the six month, next six months. I still was able to get it over, like I'm actually streaming it over like Wi-Fi and whatever random radioactive waves that you can hear going through. Um, my phone, this my actual phone is the hotspot between this phone and my laptop. That's how I got it working a couple hours ago. So, and all of that stuff for AirPlay mirroring is all like proprietary and expensive. So I wouldn't build a, a solution off of that. I'm hoping that if Apple can fix the iOS acts as a webcam thing, then you can bring in the um, image recognition stuff. So just like you had a part of it, it was like an exercise to the reader. Um, the image recognition where you can kind of close the loop um, and make it a, a full-fledged thing where not only you're doing things, but you can um, do verification. Um, yeah, that'll be in the future, or as an exercise to you. There's one other aspect of it, though. I noticed um, that if you're doing, there's another argument for robotics. Uh, from a performance testing point of view. Again, there's this argument for like non-intrusive testing. And what I noticed by streaming, and, and I think it's also true if you pull the frames directly off the device over USB, you're modifying the performance. Like you're throwing all those frames. That is slowing down the device. Even no matter how fast the you know, chip is on there, you're, you're doing something else that a user wouldn't usually be doing. And so if you're really, again, there's some secret robot labs that are just focused on performance testing. And so what they would do is not 
stream it over AirPlay or over a USB cable, but they would have their own imaging, like a camera literally sitting a, a foot or two above the phone, and then you would have to put that in a black box so ambient light doesn't mess everything up. So the really fancy stuff uses, again, from a non-intrusive way, um, and that's where you would have the robot and the camera and not use this USB thing. So it's all kind of the sliding scale of capabilities. For this demo, it was fine that even though I was slowing down the phone, um, that was okay. But if you really wanted to uh, have a, a true test, you would use a camera. I don't know if that makes sense. Totally over answer that one. Uh, we can take one more quick question. Um, Sorry. All right. Sorry. Uh, I'm ask a question, uh, or Jonathan. Uh, when are we bringing robot support back to Affium? Oh, yeah. Funny story. <laughs> There was robot, there was support for Tapster in one of the first versions of Appium. And Dan wrote that code. And then, like version 1.3, Jonathan deleted it all. But actually for good reasons, because like it was like this monolithic hairball of a project. And so they kind of, there's like a, sometimes there's a way to kind of clean your house, take everything out of the room, and then only bring back in what you need. And so there's, uh, robots didn't make the, uh, that's actually kind of why I'm giving the talk, right? You know, I'm arguing for robots to kind of get back in there. But the way the architecture is now, it doesn't need to be in the project. We can have either when plugins come in, uh, you can kind of pull it in on the fly, or with these projects that there's so many other kind of, there's an ecosystem now of stuff that I don't necessarily need Appium to support it, because there's very cleanly implemented interfaces for this stuff. Um, so as long as like I implement the interface, you can kind of use it on your projects. Because um, Appium's done, done the work that it needed to get done was define the interface. And I implement the interface, and that's how we all get along. So I don't know if it'll be in the project, it'll be nice, but whatever. It's not necessary. I don't know if you had other things to add to that. All right, thanks. So, thanks, Susan. So, can we have a big round of applause for Susan? Thank you so much.